Jewish and Islamic harmonious coexistence at the Western Wall, recited to the voice of the most famous cantor, Moshe Chabusha. Facts and thoughts behind the news headlines, given by Dr. Marav Rosenfeld Haddad, ethnomusicologist at the Universities of London and Cambridge's St. Edmund's College. <laughs> public prayers in Judaism today are known as Ma'amad HaSlichot HaMerkazi Mehakotel, that is, the central penitential prayers in the Western Wall. The event which will take place this year on October the 10th at midnight is held each year on the eve of the most significant festival in Judaism, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It attracts over 100,000 worshippers from all streams of Judaism who gather to recite the Slichot prayers, which are, in fact, Hebrew texts sang to Arabic melodies. This powerful event took place at the Kotel, the Western Wall, for the first time in the mid-1990s. It was initiated and organized by one of the most influential rabbinic leaders in modern Jewish history, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, of blessed memory. Rabbi Yosef was born in Baghdad in 1920, immigrated in 1924 with his family to Jerusalem, where he died in 2013. Rabbi Yosef's vision and wish was to turn this occasion into an event which would unite all parts and branches of Judaism, regardless of their countries of origin and their religious and political affiliations. During its early years, the event took place in the presence of Rabbi Yosef and his close followers, Jews originating in Muslim countries and their Israeli-born offspring. But only a few years later, leading rabbis in Israel and abroad acknowledged just how powerful and significant the event was and joined in along with their congregations. The Slichot prayers have been delivered ever since by the most prominent Arab Jewish cantor known today, Moshe Habusha, Rabbi Yosef's most beloved cantor. Habusha was born in 1961 in Jerusalem to Baghdadi parents who had immigrated to Israel only 10 years earlier. All the musical examples in my talk are taken from the 2011 and 2012 events of the Slichot prayers at the Western Wall, which were the last events that Rabbi Yosef attended. As you made known to the humble one Moses in ancient times. Maqam Saba. <laughs> Sham 
Vaikna beşim Adonai beşem Neymar ve yavur Adonai Alpanav vaikna Adonai Adonai Errahu ve hanun eri gafai ve rab hesed ve emet nutser hesed alafim it so happens that this very unique event in Jewish devotion is recited to Arabic melody by a cantor who is an archetype of an exceptionally talented Arab singer. However, the event is far more wondrous and twice as significant when one bears in mind the present situation in the Middle East in general and in Jerusalem in particular. In order to bring some understanding to the magnitude and meaning of this extraordinary phenomenon, we need, not surprisingly, to go back into the past and reveal the very different relationship Jews and Muslims often had. But first, a few basic and important facts must be revealed. For centuries, all communities of Jews and Muslim countries recited their entire liturgical repertoire and their Hebrew religious songs to melodies borrowed from known Arabic songs. Furthermore, many of the hymns called in Hebrew piyutim that appear in the vast repertoire of Jewish devotional literature were written by leading Jewish poets who lived in the Arabo-Islamic civilization and were deeply inspired and influenced by its culture and religion. This tradition has been preserved ever since and remains today long after Jews left Muslim lands, mainly during the 1950s. Recently, for several social, cultural and political reasons, the religious songs have gained wider recognition and their revival has extended to other sectors of Israeli society. Religious and non-religious artists began performing the old songs, creating new ones and capturing young middle class audiences originating from all parts of the Jewish diaspora, East and West. Both the artists and their audiences see these songs as a significant component of their spiritual journey into their Jewish tradition and identity. These songs are performed now not only on religious occasions, but also at special gatherings intended specifically for this singing, for the singing of these songs. Anenu, answer us. From the passage, Anenu tomech temimim anenu. Answer us, you who supports the wholesome, answer us. Makam ajam. <laughs> Hey! 
Ehdi bar yuhay aninu Where did all this start? We know of Jewish life in the Arabian Peninsula long before the rise of Islam. Leading historians agree that during the first six centuries of the Islamic Empire, from the 8th century on, Jewish life flourished in an atmosphere of substantial security and political stability which facilitated high levels of social and cultural integration of Jews with their Muslim neighbors. Even after this golden age, during the long centuries until Jews left Muslim countries, their lives under the Crescent were by far better than those of Jews living under the cross in Europe. The first intellectual and cultural encounter between Judaism and Islam took place in Abbasid Baghdad of the 10th century, and perhaps even earlier. Baghdad, which was founded in 762 CE as the capital city of the second dynasty of the Islamic Empire, the Abbasid, soon became a cosmopolitan metropolis, home for different peoples of diverse cultures and creeds, and where major cultural developments took place. The most important Jewish institutions of rabbinic learning, Sura and Pumpedita, which were established in the 3rd century in a nearby area, relocated their seats to this cultural center, and Baghdad also became a spiritual center of the whole of diaspora Jewry. In this cultural environment, Jews adopted Arabic language for almost all purposes. The transition from Aramaic, their former language, which had been the lingua franca of all peoples of this area, to Arabic was swift and palpable. Several reasons facilitated this transition. First, the kinship between the two languages. Second, the esteemed status Arabic had in the new ruling Islamic society. And third, most importantly, the understanding that adopting Arabic would not create a threat of any kind to their Jewish identity and tradition. The common language and the range of new fields of knowledge shared by both Muslim and Jewish scholars enabled a profound intellectual discourse and awareness of each other's opinions and thoughts. This interaction facilitated a free flow of ideas across the boundaries of religion and creed, producing similar views and concerns among both faiths in matters of social life and religious adherence. The linguistic assimilation of the Jews resulted in significant changes in Jewish writing during this period, particularly in the fields of poetry, liturgy, theology, and Jewish religious law, halakha. Since poetry was considered the ultimate art form in Islamic civilization and a major intellectual vehicle of expressing philosophical, theological, and religious thoughts, both in Judaism and Islam, it provided an important meeting place for Arabo-Islamic culture and Jewish values and ideas. Following the previous attempts of several Jewish scholars of lesser stature, Sa'adia ben Yosef Gaon, who was born in Egypt in 882 and died in Baghdad in 942, the head of Pumpedita, became the first spiritual and literary leader in Jewish history to open the doors of Jewish writing and thinking in general 
and of religious poetry in particular, to Arabo-Islamic culture, and thus enabled an open and fruitful discourse between Judaism and Islam. In his versatile work, including his poetry, Sa'ad Gaon combined Arabo-Islamic thoughts and ideas shaped by models of Arabic forms and styles with a distinctively Jewish outlook without in any way opposing or conflicting Jewish beliefs. Hebrew continued to be the sole language of Jewish poetry, and it therefore provided particular associations and allusions, generating a unique imaginative experience for the poets and their audiences, which were specific to Jewish scriptures and history. Sa'ad Gaon's poetry, and particularly that of his successors, provided the earliest text of many of the hymns that remain well known and are recited to this very day. Many of them carry the distinctive and unchangeable characteristic that reflects a synthesis of Jewish religion and Arabo-Islamic culture. This fusion became the hallmark of many Hebrew-Jewish religious poems, and particularly those sang outside liturgical setting, which are called paraliturgical song. Iraqi Jews call them shbahos, and Syrian Jews call them pizmonim. These songs comprise a Jewish religious text written in Hebrew, expressing Jewish values and ethics mixed with distinctive Arabo-Islamic poetic features of form, style, and even content, and sang to a melody of existing Arabic song on Jewish celebrations. From that point on, and in fact until the present day, Jewish poets living in the Arabo-Islamic civilization, and later those outside as well, would be writing Hebrew religious poetry fashioned by this exact combination of elements. It is true that in many aspects the relationship between Judaism and Islam was characterized by cross-fertilization. However, in poetry, many scholars agree that the influence of the Arabo-Islamic culture and religion on Jewish poetry was enormous and almost entirely one way. This assertion is equally valid in the case of music. Despite the fact that the origin of the custom of adapting Arabic melodies to Hebrew religious text is still to be uncovered. Based on rabbinic writing from the 11th century, I can say with a great degree of certainty that this custom was prevalent among Jewish communities in the Middle East and North Africa at least as early as the 10th century. Furthermore, the one and only music prevalent among Jews originating in Muslim countries and their offspring and used in their religious cultural life was and still is entirely and purely Arabic. Since Arabic music dictates a specific singing style and technique which is typical to the performance of both Arab Jewish and Arab Muslim singers and cantors, the similarities between the Jewish and the Muslim performers are striking to the extent that non-Jewish and non-Muslim listeners would easily think that they are the same despite the different languages used. Adon Haslichot, Lord of Forgivings, Maqam Nahawand. Adon Haslichot, Bohen Levavot. Bene Hamot Zoher Berit Avot Hatanu Lefani Kharahim Alenu Tovum
מיטיב לבריות. כובש עוונות לא בצדקות. חטאנו לפניך רחם עלינו. נורא תהילות סוליח עוונות. חטאנו לפניך רחם עלינו. פועל ישועות צופה עתידות. קורא הדורות רוכב ערבות. שומע תפילות תמים דעות חטא. The past religio-cultural coexistence between Judaism and Islam sounds like one of the exotic tales taken from the Arabian Nights. But it is not quite. In modern Israel, another Baghdadi rabbi, Rabbi Yosef, facilitated the annual event on the eve of the Day of Atonement, which highlights the past relationship between His outstanding cantor, Habusha, who also has Baghdadi origins, performs exquisitely with his superb voice and typical Arabic warm and deep timbre, this moving and intimate Hebrew prayer to the sounds of equally moving and intimate Arabic melody, which includes endless tonal nuances and sophisticated variations. But now, on both sides, few are aware of the fascinating fact that the past coexistence between the two Abrahamic faiths created such a divine religio-cultural product that survived for a thousand years and was and still is very central in Jewish life. Despite the bloody wars, And the cruel disputes between Israel and its neighboring Muslim countries, despite the pain and sorrow they constantly cause each other, Arabic music, like Arabic culture, are still deeply embedded in the religious and cultural life of Jews originating in Muslim countries, both in and outside Israel. Deep in my heart, I would like to believe that Muslim worshippers who happened to be present at the time of this event in the Holy Haram al-Sharif, the noble sanctuary which is located behind the Western Wall on Temple Mount, will hear Habusha's superb performance and will utter passionately and reverently the typical Arabic phrase of enthusiasm and appreciation, Allah, 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 Ya Salam, Ya Habusha, which mean, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, may God bless you with peace, dear Habusha. Despite everything, both Jews and Muslims pray to the same God and even use the same melodies. From this starting point, many wonderful things can happen. My wish is that this event will remind all concerned that Jews and Muslims share the different pasts. a past in which God united them, and the words and music they recited to praise him also often unified them. I hope that this fact will inspire those who can make the difference and bring the successful parts of the past relationship between Judaism and Islam to the present so that we would all have a better future. I wish you all שנה טובה אין גמר חתימה טובה. יא שמע אביוניך. O Lord, hear your poor ones. מקאם נאווה. רבה יא שמע אביוניך. המחלים פניך. 
אל תעלים אוזני חיים. היום מלפניך יאשמע אביוניך המחלים פניך, אבינו לבניך. אבותם ועוונם, מחבר ובזדונם, ואם לא תעשה למענם, עשה צורי למעניך. ומחי היום חובה מורצה כמו שייני בם ולך תכיני לי בם וגם תקשיב אוזניך אבינו לבניך אל תעלם אוזניך דמעת פניהם ותאסוף עדר טועם יא שמע אביוניך אבינו לבניך, אל תעלם אוזניך, הולך בדרך נכוחה, תבשר עם היום שלי.